This is Design Rules. Now, I know you lot are getting very, very good at finding your own style, finding your own taste, making the room that expresses you. This programme is not about any of that. It's not about style, it's not about taste, and it's definitely not about makeover. It is about some of the basic fundamental rules you can apply to a room to make it work. So, in the coming weeks, we'll be looking at the first principles of design. From light, and how it affects us, to the impact of colour, the use of pattern and texture, personality in decorating, and finally the notion of balance and harmony, the finishing touches. You know, there's a lot of fluffy subjectivity in interior design based on intuition or experience. Design rules isn't about that. It's about getting underneath the skin, judging it, evaluating it, seeing whether there is one theory that can be applied to make a room feel better, a design rule. And we'll explore the reasons why the rules work by looking at how we see, how we think, how we feel, using some basic experiments and our design laboratory to prove they really do work. Uh, just in case you don't believe me, that is. To begin, let's look at one of the single most important issues that all of us face. Space. The ultimate luxury, the height of conspicuous consumption. Our perception of interior space is defined by columns, beams, floors, walls and ceilings. A huge space like this is a deliberately impressive statement and designed to add value to the flats beyond, all double volume. Remember, height always adds to an impression of space. In fact, when you think about it, nothing shows off your wealth better than an excessive acreage of, well, air. And it's the one reason that we all give for moving house, from three bedroom to four bedroom, one bathroom to two bathroom. The quest for space is what compels us to grasp at constantly higher and higher rungs on the property ladder. Only one problem, though. The brutal reality that most of us don't live in big spaces, and never will. Forget property developers' cavernous atriums or Conran's loft-style apartments. The majority of us live in houses built between about 1850 and now, which means that we occupy small and, on the whole, badly lit spaces. Now, here, in the heart of the British countryside, in a secret location, we have recreated the average room with all of the average problems that you face at home. Stretch out an arm, and chances are you'll touch a wall maybe even a ceiling. And that's because half of all Britain's houses were built before the last World War, and half of them are more than 80 years old. OK, so we live on a crowded island, but being British, we're always going to assume that there's someone worse off than us. Like Japan. But surprisingly, because the Japanese constantly rebuild, the average area of a house is an indulgently luxurious 140 square metres. In Britain, we've got less space, 120 square metres. The average living room is 15 foot by 13. And by an extraordinary coincidence, those are the exact dimensions of our studio. Now, unless you can afford major wall-moving building work, it's down to working with what you've got and using design rules to make the space feel, well, bigger. First thing to do in an ideal world is to get everything out and paint it white. Like this. One of the first rules of space is that clutter, too much of everything, makes a room seem or feel smaller. Without furniture, there are no objects dividing up the space. Proving less can indeed appear more. See, it works instantly, and that's because your eye finds it very difficult to focus on and then find corners in a blank white box. Effectively, the differences between walls, ceilings and floor all disappear, which means that the room no longer has limits. 
Okay, that's the best way of making a space feel bigger, but the knack is not to compromise that when the furniture goes back in, particularly when you're working with what you've got. And this is what we've got to work with. It's a typical 1990s house. This one, in fact. The fact is that none of us live in an empty white box. It might look spacious, but it's so minimalist as to be almost unlivable. What we've got are TVs, cats, dogs, sofas, hobbies and uh, children, plus all of the paraphernalia which goes with them. This room, the main living room, has to double up as a playroom, a TV room, somewhere to chill out and somewhere to entertain for a family of four. I don't know about you, but I get a tremendous feeling of conflict and almost combat in this room, which I think a lot of us will recognise. I mean, a lot of us are going to recognise this room anyway. We live in it or we know people that live in it. Looking around, one of the principal sources of conflict obviously seems to be activity. Imagine someone wanting to listen to something on the hi-fi and yet somebody else wanting to fax something and yet somebody else wanting to watch television or watch a video. That feeling of conflict is in no way calmed down by what's happened in this room. There are patterns that are fighting with each other, colours that are fighting with each other. Floral. Next to Aztec. Hmm. Next to this rug. Next to a bit of ditty dotty rural revival bitty botty. There is the cardinal sin that the British indulge in beyond any other nation, which is this concept of agrophobic furniture that feels it needs to keep its back to the wall at all times in case something unpleasant happens to it. It's, it's, as, if, it's as if someone sat down and, and, and tried to work very hard at bringing as many very, very bad-tempered elements into one room altogether. How this family has survived this long is something of a mystery to me. There is a basic fundamental problem with the proportions of the room. Um, the ceiling is not high, the ceiling is actually brought down even lower by this very, very eye-catching texture which is literally oozing and dripping off the ceiling, making it feel lower. It's probably one of the smallest rooms that you could ever try and squeeze an entire family into. But there are ways of pushing back those boundaries, there are ways of pushing back those walls aesthetically. <laughs> Keep watching, it's going to be fab. We'll get back to some of the practical tricks of the trade a bit later, but before rushing ahead all guns blazing, there are other things to consider. First step in any room is to go out and come back in again. Look at the whole room objectively. What's it for? How easy is it to move through? And vitally, what's your eye drawn to first? And what you notice in here is that the window is the most dominant focal point and people crave views, regardless of what they're viewing. Windows framed in a wall instantly attract our attention. So before we come back to our project house, let's look at the relationship between light, glass and space. Effectively, windows and glass establish contact with our surroundings and views will act to expand or stretch rooms. Uh, throwing money at it helps, of course. Lots of glass and light equals lots of space, but it costs 800,000 in this case. Looking at a swanky danky penthouse like this makes you realise that these days the biggest luxury is a view, is glass, is light. Historically, nothing's changed. The Romans would only use glass in their highest status buildings. In fact, glass was such a status symbol that the Georgians taxed it. In the 20th century, there was a real shift in attitudes to glass and light. Instead of screening windows with drapes or nets like the Victorians, people wanted light pouring in because they thought it was good for the health. And they were right. 
Light not only makes a space feel good, it does you good too. Hence more and more and more glass. Even when it's grey outside. And these days it means both things, health and wealth. Which is why I think we're so passionately interested in large quantities of glass. And sitting here, surrounded by all of these windows, bathed in the light, it's easy to see a very unashamed, unabashed appreciation of space. Wherever you look, one can see at least 70, if not 80% of the ground plan of the building, plus large tracts of the garden outside. It all looks fantastically now, but it was actually built in 1968 by architect Richard Rogers. And this glass house in suburban Wimbledon was one of the first of its kind. A radical take on open plan living with only sliding screens to separate the rooms. It was actually designed to be mass produced by the thousand, but oddly it wasn't which perhaps shows the great British public weren't really ready for quite such exposure to both space and the neighbours. I think now we're less impressed by this kind of living. We're a lot more realistic about what this kind of living actually means. I mean, bear in mind that there isn't enough space in the country for all of us to occupy this kind of ground plan. And this kind of approach to living just doesn't fit with the housing stock that we've got. So what do we do? Get rid of all the Victorian terraces and replace them with this? I don't think so. Rather than demolishing one solution is to put in another window, which of course in our studio is frightfully easy. More light in the room increases the sense of space, but back in my 1993 living room, I'm limited to one window. So what to do? Well, one could take a leaf out of the Japanese book, yes, them again, and do what they call borrowing landscape, which means taking the outside, like this, and moving it inside. OK, so few of us have got gardens the size of small English counties, but even a small garden like this has potential. Placing an object, an eye-catching object, just the other side of the window will draw your eye out and extend the view. Think of it as a cheap extension. Where's the digging bloke? Clever trickery, making your room feel bigger by bringing the outside in. But even the cleverest tricks are useless if two of the most fundamental design rules aren't right. Perception and proportion. Meaning, how we see the space and how much of that space we take up. The ancient Greeks were very clever. They used as their most basic architectural measuring tool the perfect human body. Well, that'll be me then. Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man is an expression of a formula called the Golden Ratio, which seeks to section out the human body in ideal proportions. It's a formula which can be used for all sorts of architectural uses too. If the scale is wrong, it can feel cramped. And even for those with too much space, how luxurious, there can be problems too. We set up spy cameras in a large warehouse-style loft apartment and watched the owner for one full evening. It was fascinating. A room can be both too large and too small. If a room's too small, we feel closed in like a cell. If a room is too large, I think we feel vulnerable. I think it may be something to do with not wanting someone to come up behind us. So, for example, in restaurants, people prefer the seats with the backs against the wall, and they want to look out onto the restaurant. And I think if we're in a very big space, we usually spend most of our time in the middle of the space, where someone can come from behind, where we can't see them, and I think that makes us feel a little bit vulnerable. 
For big spaces, something most of us don't have to worry about, the solution is to screen off sections of the room or else seek refuge in somewhere smaller, which feels safer. It's all about perception. To make a limited space feel bigger, we have to delude our brains, trick them, which is what we're doing in our 1990s house. Working with what you've got, not chucking out the furniture, living with what we've got. Then there's the ceiling and the walls. Now remember, in here, the ceiling used to be extravagantly textured, which caught your eye the whole time, and brought the ceiling down. That's all gone, painted, plastered. And then the conflicting colour scheme. Bye-bye to that too. Sleek, clean blue instead. No one can make a room physically bigger, but by using the right kind of colours and making the right kind of architectural choices, you can make a space, even a small space like this one, feel larger. Remember that idea I had earlier, nabbing a little bit of front garden for use in the living room? The same kind of aggressively expansionist approach can be used inside as well. <laughs> ongoing policy of robbing Peter to make Paul feel much larger, I've got my eye on annexing the kitchen. The double glazed doors do a very good job at allowing you to see into the kitchen from the living room at all times, so it seems quite straightforward to use the same light oak flooring throughout, but it gets even more clever than that. We all know that in echoey rooms, soft floor coverings like carpets and rugs absorb noise, but they do the same job to light as well because they're made of tens of thousands of tiny filaments that suck light in and hold it like a sponge. Look, watch this. Putting anything hard and relatively shiny on the floor, such as laminate, timber, ceramic tiles, marble, or some sorts of stone, will bounce sound back, and in the same way, bounce light back. Look at this. 130, that's over double the light reading we got off carpet. That maximizes the light and maximizes the feeling of space. Cleverly, the direction of the flooring can also have an impact. Diagonal lines like these increase the feeling of width, C. Whilst vertical lines accentuate the length and depth. There you go. It all boils down to perception, how we see things. I mean, obviously, we occupy a three-dimensional world, but our eyes, bless them, only ever send us flat two-dimensional images. We rely on our brains to fill in all the gaps with the information that we've learned since childhood about size, shape, and... DISTANCE! You see, the thing is, we're not actually born with an understanding of space. The brain has to work it out by touch and feel. Experiments show this process starts from the age of four months and has to continue for, well, years. To us, the world is three-dimensional. And what we, it's very hard to realise is that being able to see the world in three dimensions requires a huge leap of processing, almost of imagination. So light coming into the eye is reflected onto the retina. And the retina is a flat screen. It's like a television screen. It doesn't have three dimensions on the retina. What we have to do is calculate the three-dimensionalism of the world from that. And so we use stereopsis, the fact that each eye is seeing a slightly different image. 
But we don't rely on stereopsis as much as many people think we do. And that's because we use a whole raft of other cues as well. There's perspective, texture. Objects that are further away have lower contrast, they're paler, they're the color of the sky. This means that we can actually fool the visual system by manipulating the cues. There are plenty of ways of tricking the eye, but here are a few practical tips. Now, vertical lines draw the eye upwards, increasing the feeling of height. Horizontal lines, including picture rails and blocks of colour below the dado, bring the height down, but increase the feeling of width. Now, strong colour that comes forward to greet the eye on short walls decreases the depth, but increases the width of a room. The opposite is true if you put strong colour on the long walls. You get a, a long, thin corridor effect. And then, of course, dark colour on the ceiling or on the floor will bring the whole space down. You see, it's all in the eye, or rather, the brain. the maximum visual impact from a space, I think you always have to understand how the space is going to be used. And here, in a stairwell, you're going to get a lot of long, tall, thin verticals. So what a clever designer like Charles Rennie Mackintosh did, and he was a master at space games, was to balance the verticals by a heavy, broad band of dark timber. But that band of timber does something else. It heightens the theatricality of coming up the stairs. You're literally coming from the dark timber panelling up into the light plaster finish. From the darkness to the light. So half of interior decorating is illusions. One half is actually knocking down your house, building an archway, making the room bigger. The other half is faking it. Rather than sticking a mirror over a fireplace like everybody else does, why not do this? Mirrors used almost like windows, reflecting corners and vistas of the room and therefore making the whole space feel bigger. Why such a large, dark picture in a relatively small room? Think of it as an eye magnet. Imagine your eye is being drawn to it, compelled to it. You're focusing on the picture rather than noticing how low the ceiling is or where the corners of the wall are. Instantly, the wall becomes a fuzzy blur. And if the wall becomes a fuzzy blur, it feels larger. And if the wall feels larger, the room feels larger. Optical illusions can fool our eyes and our brains, but our bodies are three-dimensional. If there's too much furniture in a small room, then we're going to bump into it. The rule of furniture in space is to move it away from the walls. This shows up more floor space, stops you looking at the corners, and makes the room seem bigger. And then finally, body space. There are even rules about this. We have a certain distance where we like looking at people. For one thing, there's a personal space thing. We don't like people too close. We like them at a certain distance. That distance varies according to cultures, but um, it's about a meter. And probably the reason it's a meter is that a meter is the distance where you can look someone in the eye and read the expressions on their faces without having to move your eyes. So if you're too far away from someone, you can't really see their expression. It's too far away. If you're too close to someone, you have to flick between their eyes and their mouth. Armed with closed-circuit television cameras at a party, let's see if we can prove this rule. 
As this experiment shows, no three people will ever, ever sit together on a three-seater sofa, just as eight people will feel uneasy at a table designed to seat six, so that is something so to bear in mind when cluttering up your room with large sofas. Not only will the space look cramped, but you'll feel cramped too. And so, the battle's over, the war is won, peace now reigns supreme, tranquility everywhere. But how come this space now looks so damn big? Straightforward practical solutions always help. Storage, storage, storage. And instead of an incredibly bulky two-seater sofa, flexible seating with storage facility. Other things are quite good. Drawing your eye constantly into the centre with things like pictures hung low in the middle of a space. The rug pulling your eye down there. The big three-seater sofa technically too large for the space. It's kind of corseted by putting a throw down the middle of it. So what are the weapons in the armoury that we can use in the war against small feeling spaces? There's the foot soldiers. Colour. There's the cavalry. Declutter. There is the heavy artillery light. Nothing makes a room feel larger, more effectively than maximising light. Even simple things like the white surface of the storage unit in front of the window is bouncing light back into the room. But the crucial, crucial element is the espionage core. The tricks that we've used to really delude your brain into thinking that this room is much, much bigger. So, to recap, Clutter makes a room seem smaller. The more light, the bigger the feel. Strong colours close a room down. Texture absorbs light and thus space. Keep the windows clear and draw the eye out. Bounce as much light around as you can. Mirrors can double the illusion of space. Taking skirting up the wall makes the floor look bigger. And of course, we all need furniture, but don't overcrowd it. How could you improve the layout of your room and create that all-important illusion of space? Find out from the hints and tips on our website, www.bbc.co.uk stroke homes. In the next programme, we look at colour, how it arouses us, how it excites us, and not to mention why women have a slight advantage over men because there's more to colour than meets the eye. <laughs>